All right, everybody, welcome to session two of the Underwriting Fundamental Workshop of three sessions. We're going to have a little fun today. So for those of you that have shown up live and for those of you that were here prior to the start time, now I, I generally don't come on till about five minutes before, um, but those that were here on time uh, were given an opportunity uh, to utilize a deal that they're working on right now so that we can underwrite that deal for this session right? and next session. So we'll pull the fundamentals today and we'll uh, actually throw it in an underwriting model tomorrow. So for those that are late or those that are watching this recording, if you come on live and you come on time, I like to reward folks. So uh, one of the members has emailed me or is in the process of emailing me the information, a T12, an OM, and a rent roll. And so when we start talking about the fundamentals today and finding those um, fundamentals, we have an address that we can create a trade area for inside the supply and demand tools uh, in order to pull out our fundamentals. So we will utilize uh, that, spe that specific opportunity uh, to take a look at this, okay? Now, from conversations him and I have already had, we already know that this deal is way stupidly overpriced. So he is not worried about anybody stealing this thing because if you want to pay that much, maybe you got to go into another community because you're darn, darn sure not paying attention to me. All right, so that said, uh, from last week, any questions before we move on to what we have to do today? I want to make sure everything was clear from last week. Come on, guys. I don't teach that good. Nobody's that good. Richard, if you're trying to talk to us, you are muted. Okay, roger that. Okay, well, then I will assume there are no questions and that I'm a great instructor. Just kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, quiet over there in the peanut gallery there in Connecticut. I see how you are. All right, I am going to, actually, I'm not going to mute people today uh, because this is going to be an interactive session um, where we're actually looking at apparently a real opportunity. So uh, as we go through it, if you guys want to ask questions, um, feel free to do so while we're going through this. What I am going to do, though, is minimize this so I cannot see you guys. So don't sit there and raise your hand like this because I won't see it. Uh, I will pull the chat up so I can see the chat. So I'm going to put that down here in the corner. There is a few parts to this presentation with PowerPoint, uh, but we're going to spend the majority of the time inside the tools looking for these assumptions, okay? So questions before I get started. Well then let's roll. All right, our agenda for today. Why the assumptions are important. Most people have heard me talk about these assumptions for quite some time. Why are they so important, David? You, you put a lot of emphasis in them and nobody else seems to care. Well, we'll cover that. Where do we get the data? And really, where do we get the data and what data are we going after? So we'll cover both of those. We'll look at how to create the trade area. So this is the, you'll hear some gurus call it a neighborhood. Um, it's really more than a neighborhood, but it is less than a submarket. We are looking at, uh, if you guys don't mind, mute yourselves. Um, if you don't have a question, I can hear background noise. Um, we want to draw a trade area that will encompass the direct competition for the asset that we're underwriting. I'm going to show you how to do that in the tools. Then you'll get a chance to practice it yourself in some other mapping tool because I can't give you access to CoStar. Then we'll talk about the actual assumptions themselves. And so then we'll go back into those tools and we'll pull those assumptions. And then we will uh, interpret the data from all of the reports that I pull so you guys can see 
how I interpret all the data right here, real time on a real deal. Okay. So that's what we're going to cover today. Ought to be a fun class. I have no idea how long this is going to take. It'll be at least an hour. Um, we may go three hours. I don't know. But let's be prepared to have fun um, because there's going to be a lot of questions. All right. So why are the assumptions important? So it, it'll be fairly quick up until the point where we start going into the tools and that's where things will slow down. So why the assumptions are so flipping important? Well, it takes out the guesswork. Uh, you guys may have heard my tagline. We provide a data-driven approach, okay? Everything, all of our decisions should be based on data, not some guesswork, not because some guru said so, not because of some stupid rule of thumb. Oh, for those of you that get to know me better, because I know we got a lot of new people here, I absolutely cannot stand rule of thumbs because every single market in this country is different. There is no freaking way in the world that your price per unit for management is the same in Mobile, Alabama as it is in San Francisco, California. Sorry, doesn't work that way. Rule of thumbs are junk. Do not pay attention to them. So for those that use the syndication deal analyzer that relies on rule of thumbs, that's about all I have to say about that. But we'll, uh, we'll go in and we'll look at the actual data that we need to put in, not some stupid rule of thumb. This will give you confidence in your underwriting. You now know you have a data-driven approach. So it's data. All we have to do is interpret it. And yeah, there can be a misinterpretation of the data, but once I show you what to do and how to look at it, you'll be like, oh, <laughs> this is pretty freaking easy. How come I haven't been doing this for the whole time? Why are these stupid gurus lying to me? It, it's crazy what's going on in the marketplace, but all of that's correcting as we speak. So you guys are going to be ahead of the uh, ahead of the class where you're going to understand correct underwriting fundamentals. So that'll put you a little bit ahead. This also, as you're talking to partners, as you're talking to investors, whether you're trying to JV, whether you're trying to find capital partners, if you're wanting to do syndication and look for passive investors, when you're having conversations with them, if you're talking about a market, if you're talking about a deal and you're using data to describe it, you're going to set yourself apart from everybody else because nobody else talks about data. They talk about stupid websites and uh, what this guy said and what that broker said and, and what this broker's report showed. Come on, guys. The, the, every one of those have a hidden agenda and it's to get money from you. They're, there, they're in business to make money. Okay. I have no hidden agenda here. I'm just teaching you the fundamentals, right? So that's why these assumptions are so important. And really the two biggest things, it gives you confidence so that you can underwrite and not be worried about looking for uh, JV partners, capital partners, or passive investors. So where do we get the data? Well, on the supply side, so we have supply demand, right? Supply are, that's the units, the space, the place where people live, that's supply. Demand is people. People are demand. And um, for those of you that are on the free trial right now for the strategic partnering community, I highly, 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 highly recommend going through at minimum module four when it opens up for you. It should open up within 12 days of you signing up. So you've got plenty of time within your 30 day window whether you ended up coming in for 30 days, 90 days, or 120 days, depending on which promotion it was, um, you uh, that module in the strategic partnering workshop is market analysis. And we're going to dig a little bit into market analysis today because we have to do that in order to determine our assumptions. But take a deeper dive and understand the, de the demand and supply fundamentals when looking at a market so you can get a grant more uh, 30,000 foot level at the MSA, a little bit of a granular level at 
the submarket, and then of course, where we're going to go today into the trade area. So there are areas we are not going to cover that you can get and fill that gap in module four in the strategic partnering workshop. It also happens to be the hardest module of the entire course. So let me just throw that caveat out there. Stop laughing, Roger. I can't see you, but I know you're laughing. All right. So what supply side tools are we going to use? The space itself, the units, that's our supply side data. Okay. I specifically use CoStar. I have not found a better tool, especially for, well, really, they are the only tool that provides data under 50 units and outside of the top 135 markets. Every other tool on the market, whether it's Reese, whether it's Yardy Matrix, whether it's Axiometrics, any of the rest of the supply side tools, they only provide data for over 50 units and only in the top 135 markets. So CoStar, because they own apartments.com, they were able to aggregate data in every market in the country. Right now, CoStar has over uh, has 390 MSAs. There are only 396 as defined by the federal government. So they only lack six MSAs. So there is no better tool than CoStar. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So these are the places where we can get our supply side data. Now, I did not put Axiometrics up here because Axiometrics is, um, it may even be on the way out the door. I, I haven't heard anything from Axiometrics in a long time, um, but they were really, really, really expensive and they were only in a few markets. So um, it's why they didn't make this list. These are the top three. And CCIM now has a contract with Reese, but I gotta be honest, the data is not that good right now. So CoStar is still your best choice. Okay, notice I did mention apartments.com, but I did not say apartments.com is where we go to get rental data. Don't do that, okay? That is a huge error that's being taught by the gurus because they don't want to tell you that you need to pay for other tools. They only want you paying them money, nobody else. Well, I'm here to tell you, keep your money in your pocket. Don't listen to these gurus and go buy a tool like CoStar that will actually help you do this, okay? And Rentimeter, oh my God, the people that use Rentimeter, okay? So you can look up an area. You can't control the area. You can't uh, drill down into what we call a Tyson polygon. You can't go into a one mile, two mile, three mile ring. All you can do is go into an area, put in what your criteria is, and it'll bring up asking rents. But that's all it does. It doesn't give you any historical rental data, doesn't give you any vacancy data, doesn't give you any construction, absorption, nothing. You don't get any other data with either one of these tools. Stop using them to do your supply side data. You're just screwing yourself doing that, okay? You need real data, look at the analytics so we can go back, look at what's happened in the history so that when we're looking at, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, something like vacancy. When we look at vacancy and credit loss, the market may be at 97% occupancy right now. Well, I guarantee you a lender is not gonna give you a loan for your deal based on 97% occupancy. What they're going to do is they're going to look at the long-term occupancy average and CoStar will go back 22 years, goes all the way back to the year 2000. So you can look at that long-term average, same thing. And I'll show this to you when we get there with your, um, your rental growth. A lot of people are putting eight, nine, 10% rental growth because of what happened in 2021. But you look at the 20 year history in the market and for the prior 19 years, to 2021, there was nothing over 3% or 4% growth, yet they're putting 8, 9, 10 because in 2021, our anomaly year, but it makes the data skewed. So you have to use a data-driven approach. We'll, we'll take a look at that. So get the tools, pony up, or build relationships with people that have them. So all of you that stay members of the strategic partnering community, there's a couple on here that have lifetime access. Um, so they'll always have access as long as I'm still alive. And as long as CoStar doesn't kick me out, 
Um, I provide the CoStar reports for you. You just have to request it through the strategic partnering community, but you only get access to that while you're still a member. So if you're here for 30 days, if you're here for 90 days, or you're here for 180 days, you at least have that time to request these reports if you guys end up needing to underwrite a deal. Okay. All right. So now what data are we looking for on the supply side? Well, these fall right in line with the assumptions, uh, but we're going to get a little more granular. There's going to be some things we're going to look at here that um, are in line with the assumptions, but aren't the assumptions themselves. The first one is rents, both market rents and growth. That's two of the six assumptions right there. What are market rents now and what is the rent growth moving forward? Okay, so we want to look at both of those inside of the tool, and we'll, we'll take a look at that in just a minute. Uh, then we look at vacancy. Again, that long-term occupancy average. Again, CoStar goes all the way back to 2000. Their data goes all the way to 2000. That's a 22-year history. So we can look at the rents over a 22-year 20 year history. We can look at it annually, or we can look at it quarterly. Now, I wouldn't look at 20 years quarterly, but maybe you want to look at the last three or four years quarterly, kind of get an idea of what's happening. Same with vacancy. One thing we don't talk about a lot is absorption, okay? All absorption is, is uh, end of year occupancy minus beginning of year occupancy, okay? I didn't say total number of units. I said occupancy. So this is a market data um, metric, KPI. You look at this at the market level. You don't really look at this at the trade area level. But when we look at absorption, what it's telling us is uh, if there are deliveries happening because there's properties under construction, as deliveries are happening, how fast are apartments absorbing? Are the units absorbing in a positive manner? or are they uh, absorbing in a negative manner? So all that means in that period, and it could be any period, but we typically use 12 months. In the last 12 months, it is the net result of the number of people that moved out of the market and the number of people that moved into the market for apartment rentals, that it's the net result. So we don't know how many people moved out and we don't know how many people moved in. All we know is if we had an absorption of 1,000, a positive number of 1,000, that there were 1,000 more people that moved into the rental market than moved out. Now, where absorption really comes into play, especially right now in the market where we're having a lot of deliveries, is the absorption keeping up with the deliveries. So now you can look at this over a quarterly basis and you can start to see this slowing down. You could see it coming to a stop or you can see it accelerating. That kind of gives you an idea. And again, you'll learn this in module four when we talk about market cycles, but absorption is one of the key metrics for identifying where your market is in the market cycle uh, chart. Deliveries. You can't look at absorption without looking at deliveries. How many apartments are being delivered? How many units are being delivered? How many are being absorbed? And if absorption is slowing down, and you'll see it, the data will show it, how many more are under construction? Because if it's slowing down and there are still, let's say you absorbed, um, let's say you absorbed 5,000 in 2021, but you only absorbed 1,000 in 2022, you delivered 6,000 in 2021, but you delivered 10,000 in 2022, that's a red flag, but there's still 30,000 under construction. Uh-oh, <laughs> you want to talk about major oversupply? Oh, Houston, we have a problem here. Okay, so that's what this data starts to show us. And then we can look at the market cap rate. So CoStar will give us the market cap rate based on the sales over the last 12 months, depending on what the property class is that we're looking at. So if we're looking at just market rent, just class B, um, we want to look at the cap rate in the overall market. We can look at it in the trade area, but it's the overall market that really is going to matter. Um, 
the trade area may give you a different number, but we always underwrite to the lender and the lender is going to look at the overall market because that's what the appraiser is going to do. So I like to say underwrite to the lender. Okay. All right, so let's look at our demand side tools. So we don't need much data for demand when we're doing our financial analysis. Now we will when we're doing the market analysis, but specifically for the financial analysis, which we're underwriting the deal. So we're doing financial analysis. Remember the, the four legs of the stool of the strategic analysis model, market and competitive analysis, um, uh, legal and political analysis, location and site analysis, and financial analysis. We're doing financial analysis, which is one of the four legs of due diligence, okay? So what demand data do we need? Remember, demand is people, supply is space. So what are our demand side uh, tools? These are, uh, this is a free tool called Census Quick Facts. There's a couple of gurus that'll tell you to go to some stupid, silly website that has more ads than it has data itself. And that's fine. You want to go there. Um, just keep in mind that the data may actually be older than what's on Census Quick Facts. Census Quick Facts, and you can Google Census Quick Facts for that exact direct link, allows you to actually look at five areas at a single time and do what we call benchmarking. So you can look at the U.S., the state, uh, the county, the city, and then the zip code, if you will. So it allows you to break it down that way. There is no other tool that'll allow you to do that other than the next tool I'll show you, which is a paid tool, but free if you're a member of CCIM Institute. So Census Quick Facts goes right to the, uh, to the source. It's census.gov where these other tools that the gurus will tell you to look at, those are all third-party data sources and they're getting very old data. So be very careful of that. So I always recommend Census Quick Facts. The other one is ESRI. Esri is based in San Bernardino, California. They are the largest aggregator in the world of demand data. Demographics and psychographics. Okay, that's demand. Demographics and psychographics. The CCIM Institute has a contract with Esri. We spend well over a million dollars a year with them. And they created a tool for us called Site to Do Business. And we're going to go in and we're going to look at Site to Do Business in a little bit. And Site to Do Business allows us to use mapping so that we can find the demand information that we're looking for in the market. So when I draw out my trade area in CoStar, I can duplicate that inside uh, site to do business, which is built on ESRI. The other th cool things about uh, site to do business is we have some economic data tools as well. Um, although they're still a little bit under development, they're not perfect yet. Um, but we generally will go to Bureau of Labor Statistics for that economic data. Again, to the horse's mouth, to the federal government, who are the ones that are aggregating the data, not some third-party source. Although we could argue site to do business as a third-party source. All right, so what data do we need uh, from these supply-side tools? And again, this is only for financial analysis. You'll need a hell of a lot more data than this. On your market analysis, this is just for the financial analysis. So really the only one we need is median household income. And the reason we need it is because we want to benchmark it against what the market rent is showing in the area. <clears throat> the reason we do this is because the median household income, and again, this is for the trade area. This isn't market wide. This is for the trade area, that direct competition where we're going to draw out where the neighborhood is, and of course, oversized neighborhood, we want to benchmark it against market rents. So the way a property management company determines whether someone can afford to move into their apartment complex or not is they do three times the rent should be their gross monthly income. So if we take median household income and we divide it by 12 and turn it monthly, and then we divide it by three because property management companies want three times the rent. Now we know what the market can afford 
or what that trade area can afford, not what some broker told you is market rent. Or there could be, because remember, median, the definition of median, this is in statistics. Sorry, I got a niche. Median is the middle, which means half the data is higher and half the data is lower. It's not an average, it's the middle. So what it does is it allows you to eliminate those anomalies at the bottom and those anomalies, those outliers at the top so that you end up in like the second and third quartile. Now, if you haven't taken statistics, that's going way over your head. Don't worry, I never took statistics. That's about all I know about statistics, okay? Um, just know that there are going to be people that can afford more, but there's also going to be people that can afford less. This is just the middle range. So uh, which formula, Richard? You the can one with uh, median household incomes divided by 12. Yeah, so take median household income, divide it by 12 so that you turn it monthly. Okay. And then divide it by three because property management companies do three times the rent for gross income, gross monthly income. So that will tell you what the median rent is for the market affordability wise. And everybody's wondering because nobody's been paying attention to this for two years. And now everybody's wondering why nobody can afford apartments anymore because nobody was paying attention to median household income. So this becomes one of our tests for looking at our underwriting. The other one is tenure. Now we really don't need to know this, but it's good information to know right off the bat. And what tenure is, that's the uh, that's the technical definition, the census definition for owner renter ratio, how many people in the market own versus how many people in the market rent. Typically the renter side is smaller. So 35, 28, 42% of the market are renters. The rest are owners based on the total supply in the market. Okay. So that's where that comes from. You don't really need it now, but it's something that you need to be aware of because it can affect um, how you're looking at your deal. Now, when you do your market analysis, it absolutely is a metric because it becomes one of the KPIs that we need to put in for looking at current demand, okay? It's one of the multipliers, so, or one of the, not multiplier, but we're gonna multiply times point, if it's 32%, 0.32, from total to get what is the, the rental demand, okay? So that's how we use that. All right, trade area. You guys ready to go play with some tools? Questions so far while I pull the tools up? All right, Mario, what is the address for that property? Actually, it's right here. No, that's the that's a build to rent community. What's that address, Mario? Sorry, I was muted. Let, um, 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 let me work on it. Let me let me get it for you. Hold on. Quickly, my friend. Quickly. Did you email it yet? Yeah. Mm -mm 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 -mm. So he got this from a bird dog. So you guys got to be very careful when dealing with bird dogs. So it's 4118 South Way Lane, Triangle, Virginia, 22172. Uh, you said Triangle, Virginia? Yes. That's right next to Quantico. Okay. 4118 South Way. South My, Way, yes. So let's do South and see. There it is. It's not showing it as a multifamily property. Oh, there it is. Yeah, it is. 83 units. There it is right there. Southampton Community. Okay. So we have our apartment complex. So let's come on out. We can start to see other. We know it's right here. Dave, can you make that bigger? Uh, may I recommend getting a bigger screen? 
<laughs> about as big as I can go. You know, I just stretched it. I just stretched it. I was able to stretch. Okay. It. That's about as big as I can go. So we're in triangle down here. We got Dumfries up here. So we definitely don't want to go in there. So let's look at the subject property and see what kind of property it is. So we'll look at that first. It's going to aggregate slowly because we're on Zoom. Hey, they're calling it a B, even though it's built in 1964. Uh, that'd be questionable. Uh, carpet in the living room. Yeah, there's no way this is a B. This is definitely a C property. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely a C property. Look at how dated it is. Oh, my goodness. Hey, at least the bathroom's updated. Okay. So this is definitely a C property. So knowing that I can go back to my map and I got to, sorry guys, I got to shrink this back down. All right, let's go back to, where'd my maps go? Let's head back. There we go. All right, so now we know it's a class C. We also know it's built in the 60s. So I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna exclude some things, vacation, senior, military, corporate, because we're not renting to any of them. I'm gonna do market and market affordable because class C properties, you need to be amenable to affordable whether you want to or not. Uh, and we're looking at only existing. And our rent type, we, we just did that. And I want year built no later than 1999. And I want class C assets. Okay, so these are my comps. Uh, it gives me really three in triangle. So we don't have much to glean from here. This is 80 units. So I can come up here and go, let's say 60. I won't do a max. That gets us even fewer properties. So normally when I draw a trade area, I would probably cut it off right here before getting into Dumfries, or I would definitely use the river to cut it off. I would use the interstate and I would use a major highway uh, and a major roadway. So normally if I was doing this in a market I didn't know, and I had multiple properties here, I might draw this where I go across the river, I come down Highway 1 to Fuller, and across to the interstate and back up. And that would be my, that would be the direct competition. Renters generally will not cross major roadways, rivers, railroad tracks, interstates, things like that. In this case, because this is a small market, uh, we need these other comp sets so we can go out a little further. So I'd be okay taking all these. Now I actually want to draw this. So I'm going to come to my polygon and I'm going to come actually, let's clear the polygon. I moved too fast for CoStar. Sorry, give it a second. There we go. So I want to go across the river, keep coming over. Definitely don't want the lake. Well, I can change this in a little bit. There we go. All right, so there's my trade area. And I don't think I need, I don't think there was another one there, but I can click in here and I can move this boundary if I need to. Hit enter. Yeah, I didn't think there was. Okay, so I have my trade areas and I just come up here and I save it, save current search because I need it for my underwriting report. So I would just call it this uh, triangle trade area. I'm just going to put this into 
think I got a personal folder here. Maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Create new folder. Personal. There we go. Control C, Control V. And if I wanted to enable alerts in this area, something trades, something changes, uh, something gets demolished, something gets built, I can enable alerts and it'll allow me to do that. <laughs> so this is my direct competition. But I'm also going to want to know more information than this because, again, I want to get some information that is market-wide. So let me get my data here first. So I go to analytics. <coughs> And now I can see the total number of inventory. These are just the class C properties. So I'm not getting my absorption data right now. I'm only getting uh, the uh, specific class C properties. Okay, we can see that uh, nine people have left the class C market, which means they could have just moved up to the B market. Doesn't mean they left the area. It just means they left the Class C market. So nine more people left than uh, came to the Class C market in this trade area. The year prior to that, there were an addition of six. So we definitely have a slowing of the Class C community in this area. So we can see that. Looks like vacancy is increasing. We were at 2.2. Now we're at 3.1. So vacancy is increasing and it shows with the absorption. You got a stupid market rent. Good Lord. Uh, you know, that's more than my mortgage. Actually, that is my mortgage. But I pay uh, insurance and property taxes for this exact same amount with my mortgage on a 3,200 3, square foot home. Stupid. Um, but we can see that the market rents have been increasing. We can look at sale price per unit, but I don't really care. And we can see a market cap rate. And the market cap rate is going to be beyond... Uh, just these class C trades, but you got to remember people have been buying really stupid. So a four and a half percent cap rate on a class C property built in the sixties, that's insane, but it's what people have been doing. So we'll, we'll take a look at this. All right. Now I can go to data and you remember, I told you we can go back 20 years. So it's on quarterly right now. Let's go to annual. <clears throat> Here's my asking rent. I got it per unit and I got it per foot. And I can go all the way back to the year 2000, okay? And then I can look and say, okay, here's my growth per year. So as I start to come up and remember the dot-com bubble. So there's the dot-com bubble in uh, 01. So the market declined in 01, 02. And it started to come up. Its peak was 5.1% growth before the 2008 Great Recession. And it went down 1.7%. Then it started to grow again. And the peak was 8% in 2016. Uh, and even in 2021, it only went 5.2. And then this year it's up 4.9. So it's had a pretty steady growth. Looks like anywhere from negative 2.6 to 8%. So you can look at this 20 years, 22 years worth of data to make a decision on what you think the future growth will be for rents after year one. But at least now you're using data to make that determination, not what some stupid broker told you. Okay, you guys see how I did this? And when I pull the reports, you get this report. Okay, hey, effect, go ahead. A uh, question, before you said it, it was it's stupid for the... Uh... The uh, cap rate of four point, whatever it was. Can you yeah. explain a little more what you meant by that? Yeah. So um, prior to the Great Recession, Class C properties never dipped below 8%. Um, yeah, you're buying investment value, but the problem has been that people have been buying on pro forma, not on actuals. And so it makes the acquisition cap rate... Uh, appear much lower than it actually is. Does that make sense? So it's not good is what you were saying. No, it's not good. No, okay, not good. But it's what appraisers are using to um, appraise apartments because that's all they've got. 
They've just got that CoStar number that tells them it's four and a half percent. Class C rents are much harder to collect. That's right, Josh. Yeah, you'll have a much higher uh, um, collection problem or uh, a much lower economic occupancy because you'll have a lot of credit loss with Class C than you will with Bs and As. That's exactly right. So if we continue to scroll over, well, let me explain effective rent from market rent or asking rent. So asking rent is what the apartments are asking, the, the managers and the owners. Effective rent is what they're actually getting. So what that means is there may be some concessions, which is why you have a concession percentage. There might be um, you know first month rent free or get the first three months at, at half off or stuff like that to get you to move into a community. Those are concessions. So effective rent is um, what you really want to look, look at the difference here. Oh my goodness. How did that happen? So 2017, of course, coming off the highest year, but look at, uh, oh, oh, that's gonna, I'm looking at concessions. Here we go. So seven and a half percent. So 2016, we had seven and a half here, 8% for effective rent. But in 2017, where asking rents were 4.3% higher than the year before, they were actually collecting almost 1% lower than the year prior. But then you had a 9% here, effective over the 6.3 here, going into the pandemic. And then, of course, we had the pandemic and then coming out of the pandemic. So pretty equal uh, these last three years. So that's interesting. Anyway, that's effective rent. Vacancy, that is just physical vacancy that does not include credit loss. And so now we can look at when we're going to determine what's our vacancy going to be in the next five years, we can say, okay, we're down to 3-1 right now. We've actually gone up from 2-2 last year. It was at 12 in 2017, but we can look at the overall average and we can make a determination here of what the long-term occupancy average is. You cannot go wrong with the long-term occupancy average. And I'll show you when we get back over to the summary, how you can see it in a graph. So you don't have to sit here and average all this out. Okay, occupancy is just the in inverse of vacancy. Here's your absorption. Now, obviously nobody's building Class C properties, so we're not gonna see anything under construction or delivered, but we can see how the Class C market is um, being affected organically um and what was our total number of units 919 consistent across so nobody's you're telling me nobody's turned these into bees that's crazy okay so 919 units it has stayed consistent because of no under construction no delivery because you don't build to a class c even when you build low-income apartments, you build them to a class B. So absorption, it, this is organic to the class C market and how over the last 22 years it's been affected. So you can see that we had quite a few people, 2018, 2019, move into that class C market, much less in 2020 and 2022. And then of course, now they're moving out in 2022, okay? So that gives you a good idea there of what's happening. Now, because of the 8% rent growth in 2016, this 2017 exodus does not surprise me. How are property classes? They're, they're not, Julio. It, it is all subjective. Property classes are subjective. So the way they should be generally defined, again, I don't like to use rule of thumbs, but this is one of those that you can kind of use that, but every market's going to be different. Class A typically is anything less than 10 years old. Uh, has the highest level of amenities and the highest rents. Class B is going to be uh, 10 to 20 years old uh, or could be brand new, so brand new to 20 years old, but the amenities package does not, it, it is not in line, which is where it becomes subjective. It is not in line with the Class A's. So your Class A's are pretty much set in stone highest amenity packages, highest rents, no more than 10 years old. Now you judge your Bs to your As, and then you judge your Cs to your Bs. 
And of course, C's or anything older than 20 years could, could be as young as 10 years if there's a lot of deferred maintenance. Um, and obviously has the lowest amenities, usually obsolete, talking about C's. Usually there's some obsolescence there. You know, you got um, Formica counters instead of uh, granite or soapstone or something like that. Um, you've got carpet instead of LVL vinyl plank or the little six inch tiles in the bathroom instead of travertine, stuff like that. So you just, it's subjective for every single market, but it's all benchmarked against the A's. Does that make sense? So Dave, so if you put in the granite or quartz and, and, and uh, solid wood cabinets and whatnot and some LVP, you can convert that right from a C to a B? Yes. You well, can. That, you can have that. a 1950s property be a B based on the amenities package and the rent you can charge. But David, wouldn't you have to factor in the location as well because the locations are really A, B, C as well? It, locations are a whole nother animal. That's correct. But you can have a class B property in a class C area. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I don't know why you'd want one there, but you could. No, me neither. Right. <laughs> there are people doing it, Roger. Yeah. They are doing it. Okay. So this is how you utilize this information. And this is one of the two is, data isn't that sets. called gentrification? It could be. Yeah, if there's major investment going there, but if you're the only one, you know, at least you'd be the nicest apartment uh, in the area. So if people are wanting that neighborhood because they're real close to work, at least you'll be full all the time based on your, depending on your rents, of course. All right. So this is, um, if you remember, if we go back and we look at market rents. Okay, we just saw that in that data. Vacancy, absorption, deliveries under construction. And then, of course, we saw market cap rate. So all of this comes from CoStar. All right, let's go back to CoStar. You can get the same data in Reese. You can get the same data in um, uh, Yardi Matrix. The problem, this trade area, this market, probably is not going to be included in their data sets. So you're probably not going to be able to see this information in those two um, tools, only in CoStar. So now let's go back to summary and let me show you the long-term occupancy average. So you see down here, 10-year average. If I click all, CoStar says that uh, there's a 95.03% long-term occupancy average for this trade area, our data set that we currently have. Okay. We can look at list and we can see you've got Shenandoah, which is showing a three star, which is borderline class B. Uh, so is Eastgate Apartments. The other three uh, are two star, which are clear, cl clear class C's, but you can end up having class C's that are three star as well. So this allows me to just kind of look here. Now, this one does not have any rental data to it. So I would remove it from the comp set. And you can see here that the rents range from 1,095 to 1,570 and from $1.58 a foot to $1.71 a foot. Now, you can look at your average rent per foot and try to figure out what your market rent is gonna be, <clears throat> but you gotta be careful of the unit size. So if the average unit size is 700 square feet and you have 920 square feet in that data set, I'm not using the average square feet. I like to keep it within 10%. If the average unit size is within 10% of the subject property, then I'll go ahead and use average square foot. You can be a little bit more accurate that way, but anything outside of 10%. So if I've got a thousand square feet, I'll look at it from 900 to 1100. That's how I use it. Um, but in this case, we range from 700 to 920. So it's well beyond that 10% range. So I'd stick with, uh, well, effective rent per unit, not asking, okay? So pretty high for this little market, that's for sure. Um, but it is Virginia coastline, okay? So this is just some areas you can glean. Now, what I do when you ask for a full underwriting report is I will take 
which property was it that we were looking at? You guys remember? Uh, oh, it's been excommunicated from our filters. Oh, because yeah, CoStar not. thinks because CoStar thinks it's a B. That's why. Yeah. So it got excommunicated. So I'd filter it back in. I'd get rid of all the C's. I'd check the box and then I can pull a full underwriting report, which will give you a summary of all the information we've gone over by looking at the raw data. The raw data is more accurate in my opinion. Okay. Um, so back to analytics and the summary. And of course you've got that market cap rate. Okay. So that's how we pull that information. Now, the next thing we would do is we'd go back to the map. I would X this out. And now I'd come a little further out. I would get rid of, well, I'd still do the 60 because I want on-site management, but I would eliminate the existing and I would eliminate the class C. I'd leave everything else the same up to 1999. Actually, I want to know, although it's not going to affect it, with that old of a property. Whoop. I don't know how I did that. Let's just see what the overall market is. Good, 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 good. Okay, so now all we're doing is we're uh, we're excluding these. And we're, and we're only looking at market rents. So let's come back down to triangle, 60 plus units. Where's Norfolk? Alexandria's up there. Oh, this is Northern. Ah. Yeah, that's Northern. Yeah. That explains the rents. Yep. That's about two hours, two hours from Norfolk. So I'd, I'd look at this little area right here. Uh, I don't need to save this. So I'd go to analytics. I'm just kind of trying to glean some information here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Big time. Okay. So we don't have anything under construction. Uh, absorption is definitely slowing. So the overall markets, now we're looking at A's, B's, and C's. So it looks like more people are moving out than are moving in. So that explains the vacancy increase. Still does not explain the market rent increase. That should not happen. So as vacancy increases, the rents should start going down. They're just not caught up yet. And you still have this four and a half percent. So just some more ways to look. But let's look at deliveries. Let's go to data. Only other difference here. So it looks like nothing's been delivered since 2014 to 2013. So it's been stable as far as that's concerned. And they're not showing anything under construction in this area. So at least you know on a supply side, um, when you're looking at it on the supply side, that the absorption is happening organically. It's just people moving in, people moving out. That's it. It's organic. Deliveries and uh, and um, under construction are not affecting this market. It's just organic move in and out. Okay, so it gives you a little bit better of an idea of the trend that's happening, and it looks like the trend is moving out of the area. Okay, although small numbers compared to what were the total number of units? Twenty two hundred units. So small, but still showing that trend. All right, so that's how we look at our supply side data. All right, let's go back. That's how you draw. Now, I want to I want to show you guys something. When we draw the trade area, the first thing you really need, and um, Mariel lives a couple hours away from this area, so he's probably familiar with the area. If you're in Connecticut and you're looking at a property in Atlanta, and you've been to Atlanta twice in your life, you probably aren't going to know how to draw that trade area. You can make you can make a an informed guess because I've taught you how to draw trade areas. So you're going to use boundaries to do it. 
but that may not actually be the correct boundaries for the market because, and I'll show this to you in Mobile, um, different markets have different areas where you cross one major street and you go from an affluent neighborhood to a very low income neighborhood, especially in the South. The South is, pre especially Mobile, Atlanta, and Houston are just known for that where in order to get to an affluent neighborhood, you got to go through three low-income neighborhoods to get there. So you have to know where those boundaries are. This is where boots on the ground can help you. Okay, this is our direct competition to the subject property. We, you saw me draw that trade area for, um, for this property in Virginia, in, uh, crap, forgot the name of the place already. Doesn't matter. Um, I used... I wanted to use boundaries, but we didn't have enough data within those boundaries because this was a really small area. So we had to expand in order to be able to have a good data set. Renters will do the same thing. If there's only two properties to choose from and they don't like either one, they will go a little further to get a property they like. The way a renter thinks, now I like to think the way a renter thinks. I was a renter most of my life before getting into real estate. My number one criteria, now I'm, I'm a Gen X, I'm not a millennial. I know millennials think differently, but Gen X and baby boomers, when we were looking at purchasing or renting an apartment, our number one criteria was how close to work is it? Especially when you grow up places like Los Angeles, California, like I did, where the traffic is just stupid. It's even gotten worse. So you start to think about, okay, I want to be the closest to work, but I don't want the rent to be too high. And I want some amenities, but I'm willing to give up amenities to be close to work because this is my number one criteria. Now with COVID and people working from home now and everything else, that metric is going to change, but it, it changed anyway with millennials. I don't think millennials think that way. Millennials are more uh, amenity driven than they are location driven. Um, per where they work. They they want to be in community centers. They want to be in downtowns, different things like that, where they can be with other millennials. So it's different, depends on that psychographic that you're looking at uh, as to who you're targeting for your apartment complex. So you need to know these things when you start to draw this trade area out. Okay, then of course, drawing the trade area, there's ways you can do it. What a guru teaches you is do a one mile, two mile, three mile ring. Eh, wrong answer. And I'm going to show you why when we look at the mobile market. Do not ever do a one mile, two mile, three mile ring for your uh, trade area. That is not the right way to do it. Okay. A more accurate way to do it would be drive time, specifically from work. So you can do that depending on where it's located. The most accurate is to use the T's and polygon, which is what I showed you guys, all right? And we'll look at each one when I go into the site to do business tools. All right, so the assumptions. What are the assumptions? Well, you were in the masterclass, I'm pretty sure two weeks ago, where I covered the assumptions. So we're just gonna go over these fairly quickly. We have projected rents. We looked at that. What is the market rent? When you say projected rents, what can the rent go to? So if that market was, I don't know, somewhere around $1,400, $1,200, $1,300, we didn't actually average it to look at it. We can go back and do that. Um, let's say it was $1,300 and this apartment complex is at $800. Then we can comfortably say, well, market rent is $1,300. This apartment complex is $800. Now, due diligence may tell you why it's only 800. So don't make the assumption that you can take that apartment and take it to $1,300 rents. That's why we do due diligence. There may be tenants in there, residents. There might be um, damage. There, it may have, um, you know, susceptible to fires. And until you get all your due diligence materials, which I cover in module eight, I believe, module seven or eight in the module eight in the strategic partnering workshop. Um, you're not going to know 
but you can make a guess right now on your initial underwriting as to what those projected rents are going to be. We're not going to underwrite to those rents. I'm going to say that again. You do not underwrite to those rents. They just let you know what your potential is to get to based on market conditions. You underwrite to your year one financials. You are not getting to projected rents in year one. Okay, don't even think you can. You can't. Trust me. So the lender underwrites to year one. They don't underwrite to five years. They underwrite to year one. We underwrite to what the lender underwrites to. And we got vacancy. This is total economic. So we saw physical vacancy in CoStar. Now we got to go to the T12 and say, okay, on the T12, uh, what is the credit loss? And we add the credit loss to that to get our total vacancy. So if our, in this case, what was it? 94 point something percent, let's just say five and a half percent vacancy was the average over 20 years in this market. Well, I thought I turned that off. I guess not. Um, so we use five and a half percent. The lender, their minimum is 5%. So we're in line. It's our long-term occupancy average and it's under what they're or over what the lender will do. So that's good. So we're at five and a half. But if I've got three, four, five percent credit loss looking at the T12, I need to add that to my vacancy totals. All right. Now that's for year one. Moving beyond that, you can adjust that credit loss based on what you believe your property management company or your operating partner can operate the property at for better collections. Obviously, the previous management company or the previous owner didn't do a good job of collecting. Maybe you guys can do better. But in year one, you're going to use what the T12 says, which is not how people have been underwriting. Okay, income growth we covered. You looked at that 20-year average. This market actually had some pretty good income growth. I was actually pretty impressed with it. Um, but I would probably look at 4 or 5% um, based on all those numbers we saw. But you know what? It's not going to matter because of what we're going to put for expense growth. So who can chime in? And if I do 5% for income growth, what am I going to do for expense growth? 5%. Five. Darn tootin', 5%. Okay, we're not going to manipulate the model. We have no idea what our income or expense growth, expense growth is going to be. We're in an inflationary environment. Did you guys catch the number yesterday? Or was it, was it yesterday? Yeah. Do you see the wholesale number came out yesterday for inflation? Did you guys catch that? Anybody know what it was? Come on, the news media has been telling you we've captured inflation. Inflation's starting to go down. That wholesale number sure the hell didn't say that yesterday. Nobody saw it? Well, you guys got to pay attention. There might be a quiz later. 0.3% month over month. That's wholesale. That's not retail. That's your retailers. It costs them 0.3% month over month more to purchase the goods they're going to sell you. Pay attention, there might be a quiz later, okay? So we have no idea what the expense growth is going to be. We have no idea what the income growth is going to be. We can look at the history and be able to uh, get some good information about that. But two, three, four, five years from now, none of us have a clue. Too many things can happen. So it doesn't matter what you put. I don't care if you put 25% income growth as long as you put 25% expense growth. Do not manipulate the model. And as long as you do that, where they're equal, then the property, when it operates, will operate at its own income growth and its own expense growth. But you didn't manipulate the model to try to get more investors or to try to get a loan. Okay? I hope you guys understand that. That's just good, fundamental, conservative underwriting. Okay? Your loan or refi interest rate and loan to value. Okay? What, what kind of loan can you get right now? Now, in the last month, it's gone down. So a month ago, Freddie Mac was at 7 point, was it 1.8 or 2.8? Something like that. Today, they're at 6.5 something. So um, they've come down almost a full point. Um, they're going to go back up because next month, the interest rate's going to go up again with the Fed fund rate. But right now, they've been trending downward because of 
the good things that have been happening in the market, of course, most of it's been artificially propped up, but um, the jobs number that came out said, uh, uh oh, uh, that wasn't good. We had um, uh, we had more people um, that were hired than were expected by hundreds of thousands. I think it was 278,000 or whatever the number was, was like 100,000 higher than what was anticipated, which showed that the employment market is still strong. That is not good in an inflationary environment. Uh, Fed hasn't said a word since that came out. So pay attention to what happens in December. We don't have an election to worry about anymore. Okay. But what's that loan refi? So you can't say a year ago, loans were 3.2%. A month ago, they were 7.5%. Today, they're only 6.5%. They're on their way down again. So I think I'm going to be able to get a 4% loan. Too short of a time period, all right? If you want to look at the long-term average, and I don't, I don't know where to go find that. Probably Google it and you'd find it. <clears throat> but if you look at the long-term average of what a loan is, and, and actually you can look at the 10-year because loans are um, benchmarked off the 10-year um, or even the, the uh, prime rate. The Wall Street Journal prime rate, you can go back 20, 30 years and you can see that we're somewhere between six and 8% for loans over that 20 to 30 year average. So you need to think about that, excuse me, in the type of environment we're in moving forward. If we're still raising interest rates, if inflation is still climbing, then we want to think about that when we go to do the refinance, if you, and you should not be buying a short-term loan right now anyway, but if you do, if you're going to refi in three years, you got to be very conservative on that because it's going to bite you on the backside if you don't. If you plan to sell in three years, that exit cap rate better be greater than the acquisition cap rate that you're purchasing the property for, not the market cap rate the acquisition cap rate, the actual based on financials versus what you're purchasing it for. Year, year zero, today's NOI divided by what you're buying it for. What is that cap rate? That's your acquisition cap rate, okay? Based on that, where should we be three years, four years, five years from now if we plan to resell based on the environment we're in? Now we know that that cap rate needs to be above the interest rate on the loan. So if we think interest rates are going to be 6% in 2025, which I do, I think we're going to be in a 6 to 8% interest zone for probably the next five to eight years until some other event happens. That's where we're going to settle at between 6 and 8%. Just my opinion. I'm looking at long-term data to determine that. So that means my cap rate's got to be greater than 6%. So if you're buying it at 4.5% today and you do the rule of thumb of 10 basis points per year increase to be conservative, you're not being conservative, okay? That means you only have a 5% exit cap three years from now. Eh, that ain't going to work. Now you might get lucky and it might work, but you may not. So just pay attention to that exit cap. Um, we talked about this with um, the interest rate and the loan to value. A lot of investors are saying Fannie Freddie are only loaning 55% right now because 55% loan to value because of the risk in the marketplace. Okay, that's crap. It's because you don't meet your year one debt service coverage ratio. You're overpaying for the asset. It is the number one test to determine whether you underwrote the property properly or not. If Fannie or Freddie will give you a 75% LTV, you did a great job underwriting. You're probably right on target with your uh, underwriting for the value of that asset. Uh, Julio asked, I don't know how long ago this was, are deliveries only new units delivered to the market? Yes. Now, they could be, like people right now are taking hotels, and they are converting them to multifamily. Those are deliveries. They used to be hotel. Now they're multifamily. Those are new units. People are taking office buildings and they're converting them to multifamily. 
that would be considered new units. That's called an adaptive reuse, but those are new deliveries to the market. So the answer, Julio, is yes, that is correct. All right, interpreting all this data. So let's go look, we've done the supply side, let's go look at the demand side, okay? This is site to do business. For those of you that have never seen it, this is, I love this tool. I live in this tool. I get so much, I, I can even get um, economic data from site to do business, which we've never been able to do before. Here are the Reese reports. If you guys want Reese reports, you can no longer buy Reese. Reese used to sell individual market reports. They no longer do it. CCIM bought the rights to that. So now CCIM sells Reese reports to the market. So if you need a Reese report, let me know. I can help you and get you in contact with them. I think they're like 50 bucks a report. Um, depends on what report you want. We also just made a deal with Catalyst, which is a supply side tool. Uh, it's, a, it's really a, um, a listing exchange but they are now providing supply side data because they have every intention. This Catalyst was purchased, so, so is Reese. Reese and, Capital, and Catalyst were purchased by Moody's over the last three years. Moody's is, has a mandate to take CoStar down. They plan to be their number one competitor. Right now, CoStar is the elephant in the room. Nobody can compete with them. Moody's has the budget. They're a damn near trillion dollar company, they are going to do what they can to compete with Andy Florence, who's the CEO of CoStar. Okay. So you can see that CCIM is partnering with Moody's to assist in that process. But until then, CoStar. Here's where I pull your flood reports. If you need a flood report for an area, I just put the address in, we get the flood report. Um, and then we have business analyst. Aha, uh -huh, my business analyst. So we'll go look at the median household in that other area in a minute. I want to kind of give you guys an idea. Actually, while that's pulling up, let me go to CoStar and let's go back to the map. I'm going to scroll all the way out and let's take a trip to Mobile, Alabama. Shall we? Come on, CoStar, work with me here. We're trying to get there. Right down 65 or 65 ends is where I live. I taint proud of it, but I live here. <clears throat> Come on, CoStar. Help a brother out. There we go. Let's scroll on in here. So Mobile, Alabama, right on the Mobile River, right at the mouth of Mobile Bay or at the base of Mobile Bay. This is Baldwin County over here. So this is Mobile. So Midtown is pretty much here. Downtown is here. And anything west of I-65 is considered West Mobile. So kind of this, this area here is West Mobile. Okay. These are all completely different submarkets. So if I scroll into West Mobile and I want to look at how many class B properties there are. So if I let's just do 100 plus and let's go to filters. And I want to go to class B. Okay, here's where it starts to trickle down. You'll see that the majority of the class B properties are in this little area right here. Well, this happens to be the trade area for the largest area of class B properties that we have. Now, let me add A's to this. I think a couple will pop in there. Yeah, there we go. All right, so. When I draw this trade area, let me see if I can go a little small. Nope, I got to come back out. When I draw this trade area, because I'm the boots on the ground and I know this market and there's a property right up here. So like this one on Airport Boulevard, okay? If I was to take this property, which is not a very nice property, by the way, but Green Tree Apartments, it's not too bad. It's a class C asset. But if I was, and I know it's calling it a B, but it's not. Um, if I was to take this asset and I was to do a one mile ring, um, that really is going to, uh, what's the address? 6,200 airport Boulevard. Green tree apartments. There we go. 
Okay, and I want to do a one mile ring, which is what a guru will tell you to do. Okay, here's your problem. When you start getting into this area, this isn't a very, well, actually, this is a really, really nice area, but this area right here, not so much. Uh, this area up here, really bad. So you start to see, we got an affluent area over here. We got a little bit of an affluent area here, depending on where it is, the closer to Green Tree it is. Where's, here's Univer, oh no, that's on this side. So no, so you've got, you've got a, a kind of workforce area, not necessarily low income. We got the uh, Richelieu Huntley Woods is low income. The Berkeley is, is lower. It's not low income, but it's lower working class. And then of course, on this side of Hillcrest is um, affluent. So this is why one mile rings don't work. But let's get rid of the one mile ring and let me draw what would work in this case. I'm gonna come out a little bit. Let me get my polygon. So I would come up Airport Boulevard, which is the um, highest traffic uh, street in Mobile. It's one of its main arteries. Let's go down University Boulevard to Cottage Hill and across Cottage Hill. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't class B or class A properties outside of this area. This just happens to be the trade area that you would draw for this area of West Mobile, okay? Now, I happen to live like literally right there. If I were to take a pin, well, can I pin? No, I'm in CoStar, not site to do business. But like, like literally, I, I live right here, okay? I'm dead in the middle of this trade area. This is why boots on the ground are so stinking important. Jackson Heights is not a very nice neighborhood where everything forward or everything west of university is affluent. Both Malabar Heights and Berkeley are both affluent neighborhoods. Berkeley more affluent than Malabar Heights. Medal of Honor Park, one of the nicest parks in all of Mobile. Um, so you've got this affluent area with low income all around it, all right? So if you didn't live here, you wouldn't know that. So that's the purpose of having boots on the ground for when you're drawing these trade areas. Otherwise, you would just draw to what you think would be the major roadways, which is what I've taught you to do. But knowing this market, I know where to draw it, okay? That's the power of it. So let's go look at business analyst. So where am I? I was in Lafayette, all right? That's th these are crime reports here. We got crime back, by the way. Crime went away for a little while. It came back with the new update because of the census updates. So let me clear all this and let's come on up. Uh, there's Richmond. So we're up here somewhere. There's Dale City. Woodbridge. I bought a car in Woodbridge. There's 90. There's Dumfries. So we're right down in this area. All right, so most of our stuff is over here. So let's grab a polygon. So I'm gonna define an area. I'm gonna draw a polygon and I'm gonna go from 95. I'll go to the river. And what I'm looking for here is going to be median household income. So remember we had, come on, there we go. There we go. So now, and CoStar is gonna give you demographic data. The problem is I don't rely on CoStar's demographic data because I don't know how old it is. I know that we have a direct link to ESRI. ESRI has a direct link to census. And this is the most updated date data that you can get. We're even more updated than Census Quick Facts is. So I trust this data. So if I go to infographic, and this is one of the reports you get when you ask for uh, demand side data, we can see that the median household income is 83,205 a month or a year. Okay. So we're going to find that those $1,400 rents 
are going to be okay. So let's pull the handy dandy calculator. That's why we're looking at this. So now if I've got, what was that number? 83,205. We divide it by 12 to get our monthly income. That gives us $6,933. If we divide it by three for three times the rent, that means our rent can go all the way up to 2,300 bucks. So I'm not scared of the rents here. That's why I'm looking at this number, all right? No other reason right now other than to benchmark the market rents for the area, okay? That's all I'm doing is benchmarking it. This is a test. This is one of those checks and balances. If you remember from a couple of weeks ago in the masterclass, another checks and balance to our assumptions is uh, operating expense ratio. So we know that if we can get 75% LTV from the lender, that's a good test. If the median household income is in line with the market rents like we just tested, that is a test. And then the last one is operating expense ratio. And if you remember, uh, anything really south of about 45%, meaning if it's not higher than 45% uh, operating expense ratio, so 45% of the expenses are um, to the gross operating income. So you have your gross operating income, operating expenses. Operating expenses divided by gross operating income gives you a percentage. If it's any higher or any lower than 45%, that is a red flag. That's a bad test. Anything over 45%, you're probably okay. All right. Now, let's caveat that. The markets like San Francisco, New York City, Miami, Areas like that where the rents are 5,000, 6,000 a month for 400 square feet, you cannot use that test, okay? It, it's irrelevant. So just be aware of that. That test works in most markets, but when you have outlier markets like those, that test would not work for operating expense ratio, just to be aware, okay? Any questions on interpreting the data? We've looked at the supply side, how, inter how to interpret the market rent, how to interpret uh, rent growth. If we do rent growth, it doesn't matter. We're going to make expense growth the same. How to look at our vacancy, how to determine what our physical vacancy is, and then pulling from the T12 to get our economic vacancy. Uh, and then looking at the loan, looking at what's going on economically to determine what we're doing with our loan and our exit cap rate. And then, of course, are different tests. So any questions on interpreting the data before we actually input this information next week into a financial model? David, I, I have a question on the um, median household income. And I, okay. I, I totally understand that, you the, the rent level that you've got. But let's say you had a building with studios or a very small apartments in them. Would you take into account the per capita income uh, as an affordability uh, metric, because that's clearly different from the household income. Yes and no, Roger. Okay. So how does census define a household? How does what? How does census define a household? Uh, 3.1 people? No. Isn't that you're, what thinking, you're thinking you're thinking of the average around the entire country, median around the or or is that here? Did you see I'm it here? Looking here, yeah, yeah. No, so a household is a um, is a unit that is housed by either a family or um, a group of people and can be an individual. Uh. So yeah. census is looking at single people that live by themselves all the way to eight people living in a household. Oh, but interesting. If you're only targeting because you're, they're micro units and you think that 80% of your renters are going to be individuals, then yes, you can use per capita and I would do the exact same calculation. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, sir. See, you thought I was going to shoot you down. <laughs> All right. So what are we going to do for homework? 
Either purchase a supply side tool that you need or build the relationships with someone that has them. Now, you guys obviously have me as long as you are a member of the strategic partnering community. Practice drawing your trade areas on mapping software. Obviously, you can't use site to do business. Obviously, you can't use CoStar unless you have either one of them. But um, there are ways, there are tools out there. Like if you go to netronline.com, netronline.com. Okay, I just put it in the chat. That is every single county in the country. And their um, uh, their GIS maps for all those counties in the country I don't think there's a county now that does not have a GIS map. Most of those GIS maps will allow you to draw uh, polygons on them. So go practice drawing trade areas, okay? Whoops, technology. And then memorize and live by the assumptions. 